Well, good morning, everyone. All right, everybody's got their winter gear on. That's good. Sometimes, sometimes when you come in here in the morning, first thing, it's cold. The center block's just. Ooh. <laughs> but we have coffee, right? We have coffee, and you know, some of you already brought yours with you. But we have some in the back if you if you don't have any yet. Uh, welcome to Calvary Chapel Lemon Grove. We're so glad that you're here this morning. And we're just glad, we're really glad that um, we have this place where we can come and, and meet and just enjoy each other's company and fellowship. This is what church is all about. Amen. You know, it really is. So it's just really good to see you all this morning. Uh, we're going to open up in a word of prayer and then the worship team is going to start things off and, and we'll see where God takes it from there. So let's pray, shall we? Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this morning. And thank you, Lord, for this place where we can come and we can just soak up all that you have for us. So here we are, Lord. Now we ask you just to set our hearts free and set our minds and our spirits free and, and focus them on you. You're the one that we're here to adore. You're the one that we're here to worship. You're the one that we're here to serve. You're the one that we're here to glorify. So now we offer you this time, Lord, and we pray that you would be adored here. We cast our cares on you now and pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Hebrew word for praise is hallel. We're going to start the morning singing hallel to the Lord. So if you'll join us in standing. Oh, it's 
Well, hello again, everybody. Did, did everybody have a good Thanksgiving? Oh, yeah. Yeah? We ate some of last week. Life is good, right? <laughs> you know, um, okay, I know I'm a couple days late, but I mean, it, it, it was, it is, it is good. This is one of my favorite times of year because really cultivating an attitude of gratitude is something that we should all be, be doing on a constant basis. And I don't know about you, but I think that we have got an awful lot to be thankful for. We are of all people most blessed, don't you think? We have a lot to be thankful for. One of the things that I'm thankful for is all of your smiling faces, so it's, it's, it's good to see you this morning. We don't really have much in the way of announcements, uh, but I, I think I'd like to bring Michael up now. Uh, and Michael is going to read Psalm 48 for us. So if you'd like to read along, it's Psalm 48. <clears throat> Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king, God is in her palaces. He, as known, he is known as her refuge. For behold, the kings assembled, they passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled. They were troubled, they hastened away. Fear took hold of them there, and pain as of a woman in birth pangs, as when you break the ships of Tarshish with an east wind, as we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. We have thought, O oh God, on your loving kindness in the midst of your temple. According to your name, O oh God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> your, hand, your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go all around her. Count her towers. Mark well her bulwarks. Consider her palaces that you may tell it to the generation following. For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to death. Good job, Michael. <clears throat> yes. I have one announcement. By all means. If Frank wants to pull up the picture. His birthday. <laughs> yeah. Hey. There you go, guys. There is our 53 boxes being delivered on its way to the Philippines. We believe, and they think it's going to go to outer islands this time. Wow. Um, that are hard to reach places. You did that. Yeah. You did that. That's pretty darn cool if you ask me. Amen. <clears throat> well, and he probably thought he was going to get away with this without attracting too much attention to it. But we have a birthday in our midst today. <laughs> it's the guy that's turning around and trying to pretend like there's nothing special going on. We want to sing happy birthday to Paul, so will you join me in that, please? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Paul. Happy birthday to you. And, and now that he's thoroughly embarrassed, I can... Uh, <laughs> encourage you to just when you get a chance after the service maybe just wish him a happy birthday uh, and now if uh, if you're a first-time visitor um, I don't want you to feel any pressure to give we're going to take up our offering now but I don't want you to feel any pressure to give I want you to receive what the Lord has for you it's free it's a gift from him uh, the price has been paid so um, if you're a first-time visitor, please feel no pressure to give. 
for those of you who call this your, your, your church home, you all know what to do. The agape box is in the hallway and the worship team is going to play an offering song. So uh, worship team, take it away.
ever uh, take the time to think about that? <clears throat> That's a beautiful song, isn't it? Um, but do you ever take the time to think about that? It's in the pages of Scripture. It's enshrined in God's Word. He calls you his friend. Isn't that remarkable? The God who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke it into existence, the God who is so much greater and so much more significant than we are. And he calls you his friend. That just, that just boggles my mind. <clears throat> and the reason why we are able to call him our friend is because of the cross that we were just singing about. And the good news is the cross wasn't the end of the story, was it? There was an empty tomb, too. So, I always love what the angels said when the, when the women came to the tomb. He is not here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he is risen. It's remarkable, isn't it? Well, today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, and so, uh, if you're able, would you stand? And we're going to read through 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, if you're not able to stand, that's okay. You can just stay seated. Uh, we're going to read this chapter together. I'll read the first and the odd-numbered verses, and you all can read the even-numbered verses, and it'll be up on, on the screen for you. So let's begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For the Lord has given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another the different of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one, has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, no my brethren, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets. After that, miracles, and the gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets?
prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all, all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. You may be seated. This is a great chapter, isn't it? Yes. There's so there's so much meat in this chapter. It's two hours session. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Maybe I should go two hours away. <laughs> now you're like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, no. <laughs> well, okay. So you remember that back in chapter one, Paul declared that the church in Corinth did not come short in any gift, meaning spiritual gifts. And yet, there were many problems in the Corinthian church as we've been discussing over the last several weeks. Some of those problems involve the use of the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use in the church. Paul's going to warn them about the abuses that existed in the church at Corinth. Here we have the biblical teaching on the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use. He opens chapter 12 by saying in verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So if you look carefully at your Bible, you will notice that the word gifts is italicized. That means that the word does not appear in the original Greek manuscripts. Paul actually said, now concerning pneumaticos, or spirituals, referring to the entire realm of manifestations of the spirit, Paul's statement is very interesting, because I think that one of the greatest areas of ignorance in today's church concerns spiritual gifts and their proper operation within the church. This ignorance is on both sides of the fence, the Pentecostal side and the fundamentalist side. Within the Pentecostal church, there are many abuses of the gifts of the Spirit because people are ignorant of their true operations within the church. And, you know, and, and among many of the fundamentalist churches, there's great ignorance of the gifts of the Spirit. They dismiss the gifts to another age, and you do not see any validity to their exercise today. So when Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, sad but true, there is a lot of ignorance today. And Paul expressed this same desire, I don't want you to be ignorant, in, in several other areas as well. Concerning Old Testament typology in 1 Corinthians 10, the rapture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Satan's tactics in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and Israel's future in Romans chapter 11. The areas about which Paul wanted believers to be knowledgeable are the very ones about which believers had the most questions throughout history. So his concern was inspired. Verse 2, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb, which means mute or silent, idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, which is the Greek word anathema. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Evidently, there was a rumor going around in Paul's day that someone speaking in tongues was overheard by someone who understood the language in which that person was speaking. And he was actually blaspheming God. Paul said, impossible. No one, speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, would call Jesus accursed. That rumor probably started at Corinth, but it hasn't died yet. Paul makes it clear that it's impossible, though, for a person praying in the Spirit to say that Jesus is accursed. In Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, Jesus said, If you have a son who comes to you and asks you for bread, you're not going to give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, you're not going to give him a scorpion. If he asks for an egg, you won't give him a serpent. Now, if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, I don't like these, these boogeyman stories of, you better be careful when you open yourself up and yield yourself to God, because you don't know what spirit might come in. False. 
Your heavenly Father is much more gracious than we are as earthly fathers. And if, as a sincere child of God, I am seeking the fullness of his spirit and asking him to give me more of his spirit, indwelling and empowering me, it would be blasphemous to say that God would allow some false or some evil spirit to come in and take control of my life. That's an extremely blasphemous concept of God that I utterly reject. And notice the second part of that statement. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. If I really confess Jesus Christ as Lord, I can only do that as a result of the Holy Spirit's work within my life. If you've made that confession, it's because of the Holy Spirit's work within your life. You can't do it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't make a genuine confession that Jesus is Lord, except as the Holy Spirit has done his work within your life. Therefore, if you can truly say that Jesus is Lord, you can be assured that the Holy Spirit is residing in you and working through you. Verse 4, now there are diversities, meaning various kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are many different gifts, and Paul's going to give us a partial listing here. He gave us another list in Romans chapter 12, and that list includes some that are not in this chapter. The point here is that there are many different types of gifts, but there is just one spirit, the same spirit. The word for gifts in the original text is the word charisma. It is not coincidental that charisma is a form of the word charis, or grace. That which is undeserved, that which is unearned. Verse 5, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. This is a, probably a reference to so-called gifted offices in the church, such as apostle, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor, pastor teachers, as Paul also described in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's point is clear. Though there are different offices, it's the same Lord granting the offices and directing the service. Verse 6, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. One thing that I have learned about God is that he will not be pigeonholed by us. He refuses to be conformed or limited by our patterns and our mindsets. He allows himself the liberty of working within us as he sovereignly wills, as he desires. It doesn't always follow my paths. Therefore, it's wrong to seek to receive the same kind of experience that someone else receives. God may work differently in your life than he works in somebody else's life. And one mistake that we often make when we hear that a person, you know, they give a glorious testimony of how they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or they receive some gift of the Spirit in their lives, and we might think, oh, so that's the way it happens. So we might try to look for the same kinds of sensations, the same kinds of feelings. Now, a sanguine person can especially describe things so, so vividly. I was under the piano, and I began to get this warm feeling that started at the top of my head. And it was as though it came right on down through me. And my whole body was tingling, and they can go on and on like that. So I can find myself waiting upon God and say, Oh, Lord, I want to receive more of your spirit. And then I wait for that warm glow to start in the top of my head. And nothing happens. And I can wait and wait, and I don't get the warm glow. And I think, oh, well, Maybe another night. Because I'm looking to imitate someone else's experience. But we all relate to God in our own ways. And God relates to us in his own way. Our experiences can dramatically vary, though we do have and can be exercising the same gift of the Spirit. The way it works in me is different than the way it works in you. The sensations that I might feel would be different from the sensations that you might feel. We shouldn't be trying to predicate the fact that we have received the same experience because we got that warm glow or we felt like this or we felt like that. Our faith 
should never be in the feelings that we receive. Why? Because I may not have any feelings at all that I can describe. All I've got is pure faith. Faith in God's promise. Oh, what a shame. No, what a blessing. I've got God's word, and I can stand upon the word of God. It's the same with salvation. Some people describe these marvelous feelings that they have when they receive Jesus Christ. So others are looking for some kind of a feeling rather than just taking God's word at face value. God has said it. He has promised it. I put my faith in his word, in his promise, and I establish it there rather than, well, brother, let me tell you, this is, this is how it happened to me. It's important that our faith is established in God's word because God's word doesn't change. My feelings do. Maybe I'm the only one. My feelings can radically change from tonight to tomorrow morning. But the word of God does not change. Amen. Thus, when my faith is established upon the word, I have a solid relationship. Diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. The same Lord, the same God. In Mark chapter 8, we read that Jesus came to Bethsaida. They brought a blind man to him begged Jesus to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. Jesus spit on his eyes, put his hands on the man, asked him if he saw anything. And the guy said, I see men like trees walking. So he couldn't see clearly yet. Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes again and made him look up. The man was restored and saw everyone clearly. Just a couple of chapters later, as Jesus, his disciples, and a great multitude went out of Jericho, a blind fellow by the name of Bartimaeus sat by the roadside that Bartimaeus was begging. Bartimaeus started crying out and saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many in the crowd told Bartimaeus to pipe down, to be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Smart man. Bartimaeus was blind, but he was apparently not stupid. <laughs> Jesus called him over and asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus replied, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately Bartimaeus received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God who works all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Now, is, if God does give a gift of the Spirit to me, it isn't for my own personal pleasure. It isn't a toy for me to play with. It's for the profit of the whole body of Christ. There's only one gift that's spoken of in Scripture that's to be used in one's personal devotion, and that's the gift of tongues. And we're going to get to that in a couple of weeks when we study chapter 14. Verse 8 begins, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. The word of wisdom does not come from a person's ability to figure out a situation. It is supernaturally given to answer a question or to solve a problem. It is exercised in different ways, of course, as with other gifts, diversity of operations. In the early church, a dispute arose between the Hellenists, the Grecians, and the Hebrews. Some of the Jews followed the Hellenist culture, and some followed the Hebrew culture. Those who followed the Hellenist culture felt that their widows were getting second-rate treatment from the church's welfare program. So they brought their complaint to the apostles. The apostles got together, and their answer displayed the word of wisdom. Let us appoint seven men of good reputation, filled with the Holy Spirit, that they might take on the duty of administering the church's welfare program so we can continue to give ourselves to fasting, to prayer, and to the word of God. It isn't right that we should leave our ministries to take care of distributing the church's welfare program. That's the word of, word of wisdom, further manifested in the fact that of the seven men, Five of them had Grecian names, 
which means that they probably came from the Hellenistic culture. There's another example that comes to mind. When certain brethren came to the church at Antioch, they saw the Gentiles and their liberty in Christ. They said, hey, wait a minute. You can't be saved unless you are circumcised. You know, you need to keep the law of Moses. So Paul and Barnabas gathered these guys together. He said, we're going to go right on down to <coughs> Jerusalem. We'll settle this right now, once and for all. They came to the church at Jerusalem. There was a big division over this. Peter got up and said, God called me to the Gentiles. And while I was speaking, the Holy Spirit came and said, well, he came upon me. Who was I? And, he said, and he said, who was I to resist the word of God? I don't think that we should try to put a yoke of bondage on them that we ourselves have never been able to keep. Others of them, Paul and Barnabas, told of the work that God had done, the miracles accomplished throughout their ministry to the Gentiles. And then James, with a word of wisdom, said, I suggest that we should just write to them and tell them to keep themselves from fornication and from things offered to idols, things that were strength. If they do that, they do well. Let's not lay the whole thing upon them. Let's just deal in the essentials. That's the word of wisdom. Everybody is happy. Yes, let's do that. So often, when there are differences or disagreements, there's a chance that people will become polarized. The word of wisdom can so often come in and someone will speak and say, well, I, I think we ought to do that. And everyone says, hey, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. How did you ever think of that? Really, it's just the word of wisdom coming forth. God just gives some people that way. It isn't a reservoir of wisdom that I can just tap into at any time, but in a situation that arises, the Lord just gives that satisfying word of wisdom. Verse 8 continues, To another the word of knowledge through the same spirit. This is when someone intuitively or inwardly has knowledge of something that's going on, and you can't tell how you know it. The spirit has revealed it, has given them knowledge of a situation or a person's circumstance. The word of knowledge was probably exercised by Peter when this fellow Simon sought to buy the power to bestow the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But Peter told him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray that God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. That's from Acts chapter 8. Peter was really reading Simon pretty well. This word of knowledge is interesting. I'm not always aware of when it's being exercised. Many times while in the pulpit ministry, the word of knowledge is exercised and I'm not even aware of it. A person doesn't really know how the word of knowledge operates. Years ago, when Karen and I were first married, we were attending the Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside, and Greg Laurie is the pastor. Every week, I would hear something that convicted me, and I often accused Karen of going and talking to Greg Laurie about me, <laughs> telling him all about me, and she would tell me, I've never met him. He doesn't know me. It's the word of knowledge. Now, we frequently look for some type of supernatural phenomena in order to recognize God's work or his voice. But it oftentimes comes in the form of a very still, small voice. An inner awareness, a sudden thought or an inspiration. Maybe a sudden desire as God speaks to our hearts and plants his truth within our hearts. I've learned not to look for the fire, not to look for the earthquake, not to look for the rushing wind, but to listen to that still, small voice as God speaks to our hearts the word of knowledge. Verse 9 begins, To another faith by the same Spirit. 
Now, we are told that every person is given a measure of faith in Romans chapter 12. That faith by which I believed in Jesus Christ, that was a gift of God. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. The faith to believe in Jesus Christ was given to me by God. You remember that when Peter and John were going into the temple, they were approached by a man seeking alms from him. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took the man and lifted him to his feet. That was an act of faith on Peter's part, lifting a lame man to his feet. And immediately the guy received strength. He began to run and to leap and to praise God. He made his way through the temple. People were saying, isn't that the guy, the lame man, who has been at the gate for many years? It sure looks like him. What's he doing running around? I don't know. Let's find out. As the guy came back out to Solomon's porch, where Peter was still standing. He took hold of Peter. He began to hug him. And all of the people began to relate the miracle to Peter. And Peter said, you men of Israel, and about 5,000 had gathered. Why do you marvel at this? Why do you look upon us as though we have done this good thing to this lame man through our own righteousness? Let it be known to you that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, this man stands before you whole. That's from Acts chapter 3. Peter didn't say, it's my faith, my great faith. I prayed for years and God gave this to me. He said, it is through the faith of him that this man was made perfect, soundness, in the presence of you all. So Peter recognized that this wasn't just some faith that he had to go around and lift every lame man to his feet. The Lord gave him faith in that particular instance. Now, before I tried to do something like that, I would have to be pretty certain that it was God that was telling me to do it because it would become pretty obvious very quickly if I was not speaking in the name of the Lord and by his power. But Peter lifted that man to his feet by faith and got healed. The gift of faith that is a special faith in a special situation. It isn't that you have faith in every situation. Men of faith oftentimes have moments of great failure. Take Abraham, for example. Abraham, the father of those who believe, and God said, I am going to give you a son, Abraham. God kept saying, I'm going to give you a son, Abraham. He just kept getting older. Sarah went through menopause. God said, I'm going to give you a son, Abraham. Sarah said, Abraham, let's quit fooling ourselves, shall we? God needs help. It's obvious. He wants to give you a son, so you take my handmaid, Hagar, you go into her. When the child is born, I'll be the midwife. I'll take the child from her womb, and it will be like my child, and it will be your son. And we'll help God out, because at this point, we've got to be practical. Abraham said, okay. <laughs> and so Ishmael was born. And we deal with the effects of that to this very day. One day, when Ishmael was about 13 years old, playing outside, the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and give you a son. And Abraham laughed and said, Lord, let Ishmael live before you. That's all right, Lord. There he is. I accept it. The Lord said, no. Through Sarah, your seed shall be called. Now, Abraham was a man of faith, but here he had a lapse of faith. It wasn't faith in every situation. And you remember, he said, hey, Sarah, you're so beautiful that they'll kill me to take you away. 
So when we get out of there, just say that you're my sister. Don't tell them you're my wife. A man of faith pawning off his wife as his sister. Sometimes we go, you know, we can get discouraged because the faith is not always there. People of faith often have lapses of faith. Another great man of faith, Elijah, had a contest with the prophets of Baal. Elijah said, you build your altar and I'll build my altar. And we will both pray to our gods. The one who answers by fire, he will be the real God. They said, fair enough. They built their altar, and they prayed all morning. Guess what? Nothing happened. Elijah came to them, and he said, Hey, I bet your God is asleep. Have you ever thought of that? You're probably going to have to cry louder to wake him up. Or it could be, maybe he's off on a vacation. That would be a shame. Or it could be that he's gone to the bathroom, and he's relieving himself. <laughs> That's what he said. He's a crude guy. So these guys began to jump up and down and slash themselves with knives and throw themselves on the altar and all. And still nothing happened. Then Elijah said, all right, now bring some water. Pour it on my sacrifice there. And they brought the water and poured it on. He said, pour on more. So they did. And again he said, pour on more. And they did. Finally, the whole thing was just sopping wet, and they had dug a trench around the altar. And it was filled with water. And Elijah said, okay, God, now show these guys. And fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifices, burned up the rocks upon which the altar was built, and licked up all the water. Elijah was a great man of faith, and he was on a roll. He took the 400 prophets of Baal down to the brook Kidron, and he killed them all. Then that wicked queen Jezebel came back. She heard what Elijah did, and she said, God help me and more if I do not have that guy's head by tomorrow morning. And Elijah, he heard, hey, Jezebel's after you. And he took off running. This great man of faith ran over a hundred miles. He ran down to the Sinai where he hid in the cave. There was the great man of faith hiding from Jezebel in a cave. You see, people of faith can have lapses of faith. If you have the gift of faith, that doesn't mean it's going to operate all the time. It's not as though you've got a magic lamp like Aladdin and, you know, anytime you can rub it and say Alakazam, a genie pops out. That's not the way it works. No, in certain situations, God gives you special faith. It's glorious when God gives you, the, gives you the faith that he's going to work. You have that confidence, that faith, that trust, that rest in the Lord. It's a beautiful experience. It doesn't happen in every case, but it's glorious when it does happen. Verse 9 continues, To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. Now, the word gifts is plural, and I do not believe that anyone has a singular gift of healing, whereby he can line people up and heal them all. However, I do believe that there are individual gifts of healing distributed through a person or through groups of people. Verse 10 begins, to another, the working of miracles. Again, not in every situation, but a lot of miracles have happened. Verse 10 continues to another prophecy, which is really speaking forth the truth of God through the anointing of the Spirit. The operation of prophecy is not to foretell the future, but to foretell God's heart. Prophecy consists of words of edification, exhortation, or comfort spoken at the very time when they're most needed. We'll learn more about that when we get to chapter 14, too. Verse 10 here in chapter 12 continues, To another discerning of spirits. For there are many spirits that have gone out into the world, and not all are of God. Verse 10 continues, To another different kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. And we're going to save our commentary on this until we get to chapter 14 as well. Verse 11, But one and the same spirit works all these things, 
distributing to each one individually as he wills. These gifts of the Spirit are wrapped up in the sovereignty of God's Spirit. I can't demand that any gift should operate in my life. The Spirit is sovereign in dispensing these gifts. Verse 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So we are the body of Christ. Now, you have many different parts to your body, right? You have fingers, hands, arms, wrists, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, legs, feet, toes, etc. Your body has many parts, but yet you are one body. If you drop a lead pipe on your toe, where do you hurt? You hurt all over, of course. One member is suffering, the whole body suffers. It's hard to divide the areas of pain where I'm hurting. Now here at Calvary Chapel Lemon Grove, we are not the whole body of Christ. The many members of the body of Christ includes the Shadow Mountain Community Church in El Cajon, the Lutheran Church over on Skyline Drive, the Baptist Church on Main Street. We're all members of the body of Christ. We're all a part of each other, part of that one body. And God help us to come to this awareness and this realization. There are always those who want to divide the body of Christ, to recognize themselves to the exclusion of other parts. Some churches actually teach you that if you haven't been baptized in their church, you haven't truly been baptized. And they question your salvation because you haven't been baptized in their church. There are always those who think that they are the most important part of the body of Christ, but every part is necessary for the other. Paul will address this in a couple of verses. God has brought the many members of the body of Christ together. We are all one body, and in recognition of this, if one member of the body is suffering, then we should all be feeling it. If, I, if a tyrannical governing authority tries to prevent John MacArthur and the Grace Community Church from holding services, we should all feel that. It could be another church's turn next. So Paul teaches this beautiful lesson of the oneness of the body of Jesus Christ. It's a very important lesson, one that I pray that God, by his Holy Spirit, is, would help us to grasp and to put into practice in our own thought processes. That we will not be guilty of just thinking exclusively about ourselves or just one segment of the body of Christ to the exclusion of others. Now, John MacArthur and I disagree in some areas. But we are still brothers in Christ Jesus, and we're one in him. This oneness that we share in Jesus Christ is far greater than any disagreement that we might have concerning some of the issues that we're talking about this morning. We need to be aware that when we get to heaven, there's not going to be a section for the Methodist, another for the Presbyterian, another for the Baptist. But in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, or Nazarene, or Church of God, or Church of Christ, but they are all one in him. That's what Colossians chapter 3 tells us. So these are just beautiful lessons that Paul is teaching us about the oneness of the body of Christ. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. What a strange world this would be if your body had just one member and each of us was a different part. Look at that big toe going down the street. <laughs> Isn't that just weird looking? Verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Now, if any part of your body had a right to complain, it would be the foot. It lives in the dark most of the time, in a stuffy and smelly environment, <laughs> yet it never complains. Maybe sometimes. Well, it does complain at night sometimes, especially if you work too hard that day. I mean, it's just there, though. It just functions. It's just a part of your whole body. 
doesn't seek to exalt itself and move up and become appended to your knee or something like that. I'm going to get out of this dirty, smelly place. I want to be something different. Verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No. There are those who say, we are this, we are that. We are not part of the whole body. They just don't get it. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Again, just as he pleased. That's an important New Testament phrase. Follow that phrase in your concordance, as it pleased him. God gives us a body as it pleases him, a new body. Verse 19. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now, the seemingly feeblest members are sometimes the most necessary members. I read a story about how the even the Applegate, the Applegate Christian Fellowship in Oregon, they had a mission for handicapped orphans in Mexico. And somebody donated an above-ground pool to that mission for orphans, handicapped orphans. The pool arrived in what seemed to be a million pieces. And try as they might, the mission staff was unable to assemble that pool. Well, a few days later, the mission director got a call from a guy at the Calvary Chapel Bible College, which was then in Twin Peaks. The guy said, I just feel like the Lord would have me to come and spend some time at the mission. You know, I can't do much. I'm not a Bible teacher. I'm not a children's worker. I'm not a cook. I'm not a gardener. But I just feel like I should come. And the director said, come on down. By the way, what did you do before you entered the Bible college? The guy said, I spent 20 years installing above ground pools. <laughs> oh, True story. And within four hours of his arrival, the kids were swimming. Without exception, whatever you do, whatever gifts God has embedded in you, whatever the operations flowing through you, whatever the ministries open to you, you are needed in the body of Christ. When we get to heaven, there's going to be some real shocks. The people who are not seen, not known, not up front, the people who are worshiping and praying, the people who are loving and sharing, the people who are visiting hospitals, prisons, or rest homes, they're going to be honored in heaven. Conversely, some of us who have been center stage on earth will be somewhere in the back row in heaven. Verse 25, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. If you have a headache, do your lugs say, that's tough, we're going hiking anyway? Yeah. No. Now, if one part of your body hurts, your whole body rests. If the USC quarterback throws a touchdown pass and the Trojans beat Notre Dame yet again, does the quarterback's left arm get upset because his right arm threw the ball? Of course not. His whole body celebrates. So too as we as believers. We both suffer and we celebrate together because we're all members of the same body. Now Paul asks some rhetorical questions. Verse 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? 
The answer to all of these questions is obviously no, because there is a wonderful, needful diversity in the body of Christ. Verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way than having these gifts of miracles or healings or whatever operating in your life. God has something better for you, and we're going to get to that soon. Never think I'm unimportant. It doesn't really matter whether I'm there or not. It does matter. God has placed you in the body. He has chosen to place the greater honor on some of these seemingly insignificant or the parts that aren't as obvious or as highly noticed as others. In a sense, I guess God has made me a mouth, but if the whole body was a mouth, what a mess that would be. Mm. And next week we're going to study the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and surely that is one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible. Paul is going to define the interesting and intriguing Greek word agape for us. We'll get this definition uh, for this kind of love that originates with God and that he wants to flow through our lives. And may it ever be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we love you. Oh, thank you, Lord, for equipping us. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. Thank you, Lord, for pouring out your spirit so freely on us. Thank you, Lord, for making your way known to us. Help us to walk in it. And help us to walk closely with you. Impress your lessons, Lord, on our hearts and on our minds as we go through our week. May we glorify you in all that we think, all that we say, and all that we do. We love you, and we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, come take me away. I'm free, my silly.
and the lateness of the hour in which we find ourselves. And may he cause you to look to him for the answers and for hope in these dark, difficult, trying days. May he pour out his mercy and grace on you anew. May he remind you how much he loves you. May he help you to never forget that to him, you are his friend. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God richly bless you. Amen. Amen. Amen.